Thanks so much for joining me today. First of all, what's different about this crisis standards of care declaration than what we saw in the fall? Well, in, in the fall, Melissa, I think the, the main issues that we faced then are um, mostly that the staffing challenges were so dominated by the fact that people were typically leaving their jobs in healthcare. Um, what we were hearing from our healthcare partners was that I've even heard that the term the great resignation <laughs> during that time frame and during the fall that's really what we were seeing is that people were leaving their jobs because of high stress. Um, there was a, just a tremendous amount of patients coming into the hospital setting. Um, more hours were expected, things like that. And then even in the non-clinical staff, we were also seeing some of those hospitals really being hit hard by uh, some of the staff leaving to go, um, like I said, the non-clinical leaving to go to other professions that were paying more at an hourly rate. So kind of a, a big exodus from healthcare over a period of time just for that kind of that relentless surge of patients coming in during the Delta wave is typically what we were seeing. Um, it did give us that ability or give the hospitals the ability during that initial wave to be able to open up um, kind of COVID units to increase, you know, how they were taking care of patients in, in more of a novel way because they could have these overflow units. Um, typically, the resources that they had at their disposal were um, not in jeopardy. They had ample supplies of equipment and things like that uh, that were able to help support them with or just the kind of the, um, the flow of things coming to their, their hospitals were, were good at the time. But this particular wave is different. Um, this, the surge, the massive amount of people coming to the hospital isn't necessarily quite as high as it was before, although it's getting a little bit higher. But what we're seeing this time around are kind of two main issues. They already have the, the staffing challenges they had back from the fall with people leaving to go to other professions or just taking time off or they're already stressed and, and maxed out so they're needing to take some vacation time and then placed on top of that is a large large number of staff that we're hearing about across the state that are out who they themselves are sick or they're on isolation or quarantine from being exposed or they're having to take care of family members who are sick and then also we're seeing um, or hearing from hospitals that staff are also out because sometimes their schools are closed for their kids and then they need to be able to stay home and take care of their kids. So it's kind of became this perfect storm of a lot of a lot of challenges really dominating why staff are out. And then coupled with that, this, this time around for crisis standards of care activation is because of the national uh, blood supply shortage and that, the critical nature of that. So those are the, the two kind of primary things that have, are, make this surge, this, this declaration different than the last. Right now, as we're speaking on Friday morning, crisis standards of care is active for three uh, public health districts in southern Idaho. Is the rest of the state soon to follow? Well, I think that, that we've stated quite a bit that it's very hard to have a crystal ball <clears throat> and know exactly what's going to happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. We, um, you know, are, are listening to our healthcare providers and our hospitals every single day on our medical operations coordination cell calls. We're, um, you know, paying close attention to what their staffing issues are, what their um, blood supply and other resource needs are. Uh, we know that there are some significant stressors in other parts of the state, and and as the director has used the term. Um, before it's fragile for sure. I mean, we hear that even in you know from the the hospitals themselves. So, you know, it's it's really hard to predict if the if the cases start coming down and and people are doing those actions that we talk about every single media briefing, you know, getting vaccinated, wearing our masks, making sure that we're really protecting ourselves, which in turn protects our communities, which then in turn protects the staffing in these facilities. And the stressors and, and people step forward and, and donate blood and help contribute to the cause. Um, I think all those can change it quickly and maybe we won't need to declare um, throughout the rest of the state, but it is fragile and it could be kind of at, at any moment given, um, you know, what the hospitals say to us. But I listen every single day and it is certainly tenuous and one day they might be feeling somewhat okay and the next day they've got a tremendous amount of staff that are out really posing some huge challenges. So it's it's not an easy answer to your question. 
<laughs> One last question. Uh, Crisis standards of care and healthcare services aren't just affected for patients who have COVID. This is affecting all patients who are seeking healthcare right now. Correct. Yeah, and and I would even extend that a little bit further because it's almost a domino effect that we talked about um, la uh, this week on our media briefing, where you know even our primary care clinics are seeing significant shortages of staffing, and we've seen primary care clinics closed, and so those are the places that people can go for routine care, wellness checks, screenings, things like that to help keep them healthy. It's also the place they go for some of those urgent needs as well, you know, a strep throat test, a um, uh, you know, broken finger or sutures or something, which then, if those clinics are closed, then drives them towards the hospital setting. Hospital setting is already taxed. They're trying to transfer patients out to long-term care facilities that also have staffing shortages. So, like we were talking about, it creates this bottleneck that is incredibly challenging, and which might mean that people can't get the care they need. They might not be able to go to an urgent care clinic to get their their sprained finger <laughs> taken care of, or they might not be able to readily be able to go to a location and get a strep throat test for their child. Or if they go to the, and it's kind of switching over to the hospital setting, you know, that's what we're seeing is that if there's no staff there available, they're just kind of taking, we want people to seek health care and they should go if they have, you know, an important need to go. Um, but it d does make a difference. You know, those surgeries that, that have the ability to wait are going to have to those, um, you know, there might not be a bed available. They might they might be holding, you know, tens of patients in a, an emergency department, waiting for them to get transferred into onto a floor or into a long term care facility, meaning that their emergency department is full. So there's a lot of ripple effect for those, um, you know, people who need health care that aren't specifically COVID related, but they are definitely COVID impacted. All right, Elki Shaw, Tolak, Idaho Department of Health and Welfare, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you.